Shifting our focus uh, across the Atlantic, let's take a look at what happens in India. Now, the process of decolonization in India begins much, much earlier than it does elsewhere in Africa and Asia. Um, a lot of this is because of India's longer standing relationship um, with the British Empire. Uh, it also has a lot to do with the fact that Indian nationalism um, is built very early on um, in this process. Um, now, most of Indian history is regional. As we've talked about in this class before, there are very few empires in Indian history that are able to fully unify the entire sense uh, or the entire area of the subcontinent. And so for much of Indian history, the loyalties and the sense of belonging within India uh, is more focused on regional loyalties or local loyalties, or for the most part, even on a bigger scale, uh, loyalties to caste and social class. However, because of the Indian experience under British colonial rule, um, and the fact that a relatively large portion of the Indian population gains access to Western education, nationalism, what you know, a sense of what it means to be Indian starts to develop much earlier in India than really anywhere else in the British Empire. Um, now, on top of that, the modernization that the British bring to India from railroads to telegraph to telephones to, um, you know, modern shipping and all of these types of things um, also connects India in a way that it had not previously been connected. Um, a lot of Indians, um, again, saw themselves as members of a particular city or a particular province, but they really felt little or no connection to other Indians farther to the north or farther to the south or in different regions of the, uh, of the subcontinent. Um, when you add this to the strong racial overtones that the British um, bring with them when they colonize India, the fact that they segregated themselves from the Indian people, the fact that um, apartheid was present in India for much of its colonial history. This yet again drove a sense of individuality, of uniqueness of Indian culture, that it was separate from the British, that it was different than the British. And unlike other empires that had conquered India in the past, which had eventually kind of diffused into the Indian population, or had syncretized or, or accepted Indian culture, uh, the British did no such thing. And therefore they helped to drive this sense of Indian nationalism. Um, the first real major expression of it is the establishment of the Indian National Congress in the late 1800s. And this gives Indian nationalism a platform. This gives them a political body with which they can negotiate with the British with which they can express their sense of what it means to be Indian. Um, also, because of the size and the impact that the Indian National Congress has on the, or I'm sorry, not the impact, the influence that it has on the Indian people, um, the British are more willing to give the Indian National Congress some actual real independent power of their own, especially regarding social and cultural issues, while retaining most of the power in terms of politics and the economy. Now, one of the divides in Indian National that develops very early on is the fact that the Indian National Congress is, just like the population, overwhelmingly Hindu. And because of this, they begin to define what it means to be Indian in terms of Muslim way of life, or not Muslim, Hindu way of life and Hindu culture, 
which alienates the Muslim minority in the country. Now, during World War I and World War II, the British recruit heavily among the Indian population in order to fight in both world wars. And in both cases, the Indian National Congress is promised increasing amounts of self-government from the British um, in order to gain their support in fighting in both world wars. Now, after World War I, the British fail to follow through with these promises, and this begins um, all, all sorts of kinds of national protests in the Indian colony. Um, the most famous of this being led by Mohandas Gandhi, right? Um, Gandhi becomes the face of the nationalist movement. His nonviolence movement uh, becomes famous worldwide. It inspires and um, contributes to nonviolence movements in other parts of the world, including Sub Saharan Africa, the civil rights movement here in the United States, Martin Luther King, and other civil rights leaders were. Um, uh, well known to borrow ideas um, and to collaborate with Gandhi, and they were mass. You know, they were very big followers of his success against the British. Now, Gandhi himself in India is also widely popular among the population, both Hindu and Muslim alike, because of his very inclusive message. Right. Not only does his idea of nonviolence prove very effective against the British, but Gandhi also promotes increasing equality for women. He promotes religious tolerance for Muslims, um, as well as a gradual breaking down and wearing down of the caste system. Um, now, one of the problems for Gandhi is that not all of the Indian National Congress are on board with his ideas. Um, there is a very strong conservative movement um, in India among the Hindu population um, that are unwilling to compromise and unwilling to tolerate um, a Muslim contribution to Indian nationalism or to the developing Indian government. So this leads to the formation of what's known as the All India Muslim League under the leadership of Muhammad Ali Jinnah. So this is a uh, sculpture to commemorate uh, one of Gandhi's most famous nonviolent protests, the, the Dandi Salt March, in which he marched, um, he marched hundreds of miles with thousands of followers in tow to protest British taxes on salt um, as you know, as an essential to the you know to the Indian way of life. Um, now, on the left here, you have Gandhi as well as uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, who is the other um, main figure in the Indian nationalist movement. On the right, you have Jinnah, the leader of the All Muslim League. Um, throughout this process of Indian nationalism, um, neither of these sides find common ground very often. Um, the only common ground that they find, for the most part, is the fact that they want independence from British rule. Um, because of that, they do cooperate towards certain goals. But once British rule comes to an end, the tension and the mistrust between these two groups is going to come bursting to the surface pretty quickly. Now, the division between the two sides gets more intense during World War II. Um, there are massive food shortages that hit India. The Japanese um, uh, penetrate India with massive propaganda, um, hoping to further divide uh, the Muslims and the Hindu population in hopes of creating a rebellion in, in, in India to distract the British. Um, also, the ease with which the Japanese um, quickly overtake other British colonies in Asia um, furthers this idea that perhaps, you know, Western enlightened democratic society is not as invulnerable and superior as, you know, people are led to be. 
Um, so during this time, as the divide between the two sides gets wider, um, an all-inclusive Indian state no longer becomes an option. So after World War II, um, Great Britain can no longer maintain what's known as the Raj or their colonial government in India, and Indian independence begins to accelerate. And basically the British vow to release India from colonial rule no later than 1948. And so negotiations begin to create what's known as a two-state system. Um, the unwillingness of the two sides to cooperate and collaborate leads to small-scale violence between Muslims and Hindus. Um, cities are divided into Muslim and Hindu neighborhoods. Um, in the lot, you know, in many places, um, you know, certain parts of the population are not welcome. So the 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 racial segregation that was imposed by the British um, turns into a self-imposed ethnic segregation between Muslim and Hindu. Um, so finally, in 1948, the British colony is partitioned into three states. The majority of the subcontinent becomes the Hindu state of India, while in the northern regions, two, all, two primarily Muslim states are created in East and West Pakistan, which would later become Pakistan and Bangladesh, right? So this is the breakup of the British colony of India into the modern day states that you find uh, there today. Now, during this process, you have probably one of the most violent episodes in Indian history. Um, as the former colony is divided into these kind of ethnically derived states, uh, millions of ethnic minorities in these newly divided states are forced to relocate um, hundreds, if not thousands of miles. And so this massive relocation of Hindus and Sikhs and Muslim refugees, with the majority of Sikhs and Hindus migrating south, while Muslims migrate north, uh, this sparks wide-scale violence all over India. And over the course of the next 12 months, um, somewhere in the range of roughly about a million people are killed um, trying to escape um, this new kind of ethnic divide that is, that's developed in India. Um, the violence of this partition of India is still a defining factor in the relationship between the two countries nowadays. Um, and those tensions have become even more pronounced because by 1960, both Pakistan and India attained nuclear weapons. And for the most part, the only thing that has for really kept both sides from engaging in a large scale war is the threat of nuclear retaliation by the other one and the restraint placed on them by their Western allies.